Hello everybody and welcome to another CS202 class. This class we have tried to do the Batman symbol but with an arrow because last time we kind of left on that cliffhanger of uh, who's going to come to the rescue of 202 when you all got to do in the middle of the test a uh, class inside of a class inside of a class inside of a class and they're all pointers to each other, right? So. What am I talking about? Well, let us go ahead and rehash what I did last time. So this is what we were doing last time. We're talking about pointers, right? And we said, okay, you know, what if we have a class A and that has an integer X? And then what if we have a struct B, which has a pointer to a class A? As we can see here, a point. And then what if we have a class C that has an in G, but also has a pointer to a class B? And what that means is that technically speaking, we have, and then of course in main, we make a pointer of class C called C pointer, right? And so now if we want to access the B pointer instead of C pointer, and we can access the A pointer instead of B instead of C, and then that value, which is X, how do we get all the way there? Well, here I am to show you that this, of course, will work, what we did up here, this C, B, A, X, and then putting a bunch of parentheses and asterisks and whatnot. And that's, of course, assuming that X itself is a normal variable. But if we went in here and said, oh, okay, we want to make a pointer here and say, like, in pointer XPTR, and, you know, I'm, and, you know, we can just assign that to be address of X. That even changes and becomes, we can add an extra asterisk to that one. You know, that one will be, in fact, I got to shrink it because I run out of space at this point. You know, that one would be one more asterisk in there, right? This one doesn't need to set up parentheses because we do want this to happen first for this. So there you go, even more confusion and chaos and fear right <laughs> to do this and so as i said you know not everything is lost there is hope for us and the hope comes in the form of a brand new operator that we're going to learn today that operator is the arrow pointer all right and i really wish i would have put in like i was going to put batman music but but then i probably get like dmc8 on the youtube video so i was like nah all right take down or or have ads play because of that so yeah you know, in your head, you just have to imagine the music. Okay, so uh, what is this arrow pointer that I'm talking about? And how can it help us? Or is it all a lie? Is, is the cake a lie? No, this time around, it's not a lie. The arrow pointer is called, sorry, the arrow operator is called the member. Well, let, me, let me write this cleanly. The member access operator, which you've seen actually, if, I, if you know, right now when I say member access operator, you're thinking of the dot. And yes, that's true. That is a member access operator. But this is called the member access operator arrow. Ooh. You could also put the word arrow between the dot and member, so you can say. So you'll see like the dot member access operator or member access dot operator or, mem or member access operator dot and then you'll see member access operator arrow or arrow member access operator or member access arrow operator you'll see a combination of these words basically thrown together but uh you know the normal people will call it just the arrow operator arrow op okay guess what we are going to take this and we're going to clean it up. Actually, technically the last here I should have said XPTR at the end since that's XPTR. But yeah, we're going to we're going to uh, clean this up with the arrow operator. In fact, we're going to clean all of these up with the arrow operator. So let's just take uh, let's just copy a bunch of these. Copy those here, and then let's copy the bigger ones, the scarier ones which we have 
this one and then of course the big one the big final boss which is this one and its variation which was when this is just an X right I think I deleted one too many asterisks. Hold on. Uh, okay, that one is safe. That one is safe. No, no, that's okay. Okay, cool. So, big scary stuff, right? So, the beauty of the arrow operator is that whenever you have a simple thing, something, well, simple, but whenever you have something like this, that you're dealing with a pointer, you just rewrite that with an arrow. And you're good to go. You don't need to put any parentheses. You don't need to put any asterisk. You just use the arrow and you're good to go. The second example that we see, BPTR, you just do your arrow. And then the still dot X just remains a dot X. Okay? The third example, BPTR Y, is just BPTR Y with an arrow. And by the way, the, how do you do the arrow on the keyboard? It's literally like a minus sign and a greater than sign like that. And don't put any space between them. So it's not like you're doing a special character or something. Same with the CPTRG. You just do CPTR, arrow, G. Next one, CPTR, arrow, B, dot, Y. So you're only replacing the arrow whenever you want to get rid of parentheses and whatnot. Okay? This is where it gets really nice. Look, look how clean this is going to be. BPTR, arrow, a point, uh, dot x technically eptr yeah that one okay i feel like we're missing we're missing uh something in there uh because you got two asterisks so actually the way that i wrote that that's an arrow too yeah arrow x there we go okay so the big one the big scary one becomes cptr arrow b point arrow a point arrow x so if given the choice subliminal color coding of course which one do you prefer the green or the red right so the arrow is like ah no, no more parentheses and asterisks and weird shapes, right? This one, however, it's not as nice. You do got your arrows. However, because this XPTR is also a pointer, you are going to need to put an asterisk at the end of all of this. But, you know, it's because this thing is a pointer at the end. Like this little thing is a pointer. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is like this massive technically. Like I cannot under I cannot over I can. There's no way for me to uh, like overstate this more than to say like this is really 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 nice because it's going to save you tons of headaches with parentheses and whatnot and compilation errors that make no sense. You'll see when you compile this that the errors start to get a little bit weird and trippy. Although sometimes you'll see an error that says like, did you mean to use the arrow operator? And you're like, oh, well, yes, I did. Thank you very much. Very cool. Uh, no, it was in, in C. So in C, they added, they had the arrow from the get go. I think, uh, actually, you know, that's a good point. I don't know if like the first version of C had the arrow. I would assume so, but who knows? Maybe it was added. So I'm not 100% sure. But... It definitely came to C before it went to C++. So that, but I'm sure a quick Google could probably tell us when that was added. Um, probably, you know, let's see. Let's, let's see if I, can, if I can figure that out. Nah, I'd have to go and look deep. There's no quick, like, Stack Overflow, some guy asking. 
sad. But yeah, I'll figure it out because I'm actually curious. I would assume that they thought about it then, but maybe they didn't. So now that we know the arrow operator, uh, we have to make sure that we understand when we want to use it because we don't want to use it in the cases up here where we had like a, uh, like this. You know, when we're not dealing with pointers, we don't want to use the arrow operator because then bad things will happen. This, that, Internally, the arrow operator is replacing it with all these parentheses. So when we don't want to have the parentheses, then we definitely don't want to have the parentheses. So the the sort of the rule of the 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 best way to remember when to use the arrow operator and when to not use it is just to know that I have it as a TLDR here is that uh, when you're accessing a member of a struct or a class and that member is not a pointer, use the dot. When you're trying to access a member of a struct or a class and it's through a pointer then use the arrow okay so i'm going to write that down actually do i have that here on previous classes that i've ever done that yeah i do so here let me just copy that from here copy paste so to access members of a struct use the dot operator. To access members of a struct through a pointer, use the arrow operator. So when dealing with pointers, use arrows. When not dealing with pointers, stick to dots. When dealing with both, like we did in one of these, then you have to use both. Uh, if you're not dealing with pointers, you should not use the arrow. Yep, don't ever, if there's no pointers in your program, then don't use arrows at all. Like, yeah, nope, there's no arrows. Arrows are pointer exclusives, okay? So we'll do examples of that because I do want to do examples when we code. But before I do that, I do want to get to some dynamic memory allocation stuff because it all, you know, then we can just code it all at once. Uh, well, that's a good point that you bring up the disk pointer. So we, we haven't really talked about the disk pointer much because it's a pointer and we were just, we're just getting started on pointers. But technically this is a pointer. So that's why you get to use the arrow with it because it's a pointer. So, yep. If you don't know what this is, then don't worry about what this is because we will talk about what this is in a future video. <laughs> okay? So, yeah, it's the disk pointer. Uh, we'll talk about that probably in about a week when we, uh, when we finish talking about pointers and we start talking about virtuals and things like that. Then I think we will spend some time talking about how to use the disk pointer, what it means, why it exists, and uh, how it can help us. To code. Of course, you have seen the case when I talked about like with the with the uh, with the diamond problem, and I said like this pointer is a way to deal when you have two variables with the same name, or when you have a scoping issue and you need to access something. But you know the alternative is to use the scope resolution operator with the class name, which is kind of nicer because you don't have to deal with this. But yeah, you might have seen the arrow then. So the arrow has always been there watching us. It's the hero that we. Uh, it's not the hero we deserve, but the one we need, kind of thing. Okay. So, all right, uh, a couple of things that I want to reemphasize is that we also talked about what the null pointer is, right? So when we had a pointer, and of course, to remember, to play a pointer, you put a data type, you put the dereferencing operator, this is called the address of operator, the ampersand, but this is the dereferencing, and then you put an identifier, so I'm going to call this PTR for pointer, it's a generic name, and then uh, you want to initialize this, you can do zero, you can do null, or you can do null PTR, but if you're going to be using null PTR, stick to using null PTR. I would avoid using zero because null does is the same thing as zero actually in this specific case. Whereas like I said, null PTR is a little bit different. But either stick to this world or this world. Don't mix and match. Bugs can happen. Bugs you don't want to know about can happen. Okay. So that's how you initialize things, and initializing pointer variables is a super important thing. Okay. So just wanted to re-emphasize that again. Okay, so why pointers? I already told you that you can do all these nasty things with pointers like, you know, I gave you that hotel room example, which I'm really happy about. I'm just gonna remember that forever now because that's, I like that example because to emphasize the idea is that the hotel decides what room you get. You ask what room you want, like specs of the room, like number of beds, number of people, but you don't get to decide the room number, you know, 
I don't know, maybe you could ask a hotel lobby, like, can I have room this room this room? Because it's the one that stayed here last time I came. And maybe they'll give it to you. But you have no control to decide that. Like ultimately they decide and they have a system, probably related to how the rooms are cleaned up, what is currently available and whatnot, uh, to figure that out. I have no idea what the system is. But yeah, it's the same with the computer. You ask for a space, you have no idea what you're gonna get. And uh, that's okay. Although I do wanna point out that individual variables are all over the place, but when you ask for an array of a certain size, it will try to put it together because of addressing. So when we do get to talk about arrays dynamically, that's gonna come into play. But for now, you know, we need to start with basic dynamic memory allocation, which is the main topic for today. So, dynamic, because the error operator was only my cliffhanger between classes, but this is really what I want to talk about today. Okay, so, why pointers? Again, like what was the purpose of doing all this memory stuff? And right now, yeah, you can, you can do what's called aliasing, which is to have two things point to the same location. So you have two variables potentially that, or you got an infinite number of variables now and they all point to the same spot in memory. That has its own usages, but it's just kind of one of those things that are like, eh, it's nice to have and dangerous to use, but whatever. The real, real reason why is going to be because we can use pointers to create dynamic variables, okay? So let me copy my definition so I don't have to uh, write it. It's so convenient. I like that. I'm gonna miss that when we go back to classroom and I have to write things on the board. Uh, but yeah, so what is a dynamic variable, okay? Variables that are created during program execution time, so that's when your program is running, so after you've then dot slash a that out, those are called dynamic variables. And with the help of a pointer, you're able to access these variables. And when you create them, the pointers allow you to remember where they are. So, if you watched the last video again, at some point I said, you know, that when you book your hotel, you have to decide when you check in what room you want, how big you want it, and if you want more than one room, you have to do it then. But what you can't do, at least in this system, is like the second day of your stay, you come to the hotel and say, hey, can I have one more room because I'm going to host a party or something? And then you, you say like, yeah, sure, take the room for a day. And then you go up, bring it back and return it and you're still staying in your hotel. You can't do that, at least in this system with normal variables. When you allocate your variables at compile time, when you're writing your code and it, it, you know the program starts up, it assigns to you that number of space and it is yours, but you can't ask for more space later on, at least how you were coding so far. But that's not very efficient when you only need to use certain pieces of memory for a certain amount of time. Like you might have a big, huge load of memory you gotta load in, do stuff to finish it, and then get rid of it and then keep your program going. You can't do that so far. With dynamic memory allocation, you can. So you're going to be able to create variables on demand, store data as needed be, keep them for as long as you want, but ideally when you're finished using them, you can actually return them to the operating system so that that memory is returned and other programs can use it while you're still doing whatever you're doing. And that's very good for optimization, right? Because like playing a video game, Let's say you're loading in a map, you load the map for the game, you're playing that map, you finish that level, you're going to go to the next scene or the next another level. You don't need to have all the memory from the first level. You can throw that away and actually load in more assets for the second level, right? If you have to hold the first level forever until you restart your computer, why? You're never going to go back there. And if you do, then you can load it again, but you, you're wasting space and RAM is very valuable especially when you've got some massive game that's using tons of RAM. And so you want to be able to load things in and take them out of memory on demand. So the way you do that in C++ is you use dynamic memory allocation and you're going to use it with two operators. The two operators that I'm going to show you, 
One of them is going to create these variables, or better, a better term is to allocate these variables. And then the other term is going to deallocate those variables, which is what you're going to do when you finish using them and you want to return them. You don't have to return them, by the way. If you don't return them, they'll stay with you forever until the program terminates. But when the program terminates, the program's like, okay, you left the hotel. So I, I assume that he's done. So I'm going to go in there and take them away anyways. So you don't have to, especially like if you're finishing your program already, but it's a good practice to learn to return things as soon as you don't need them because you know, you wanna you wanna share. Sharing is caring, I guess. So yeah. Okay. So let's talk about these two new operators that we're going to learn. First one, like I said, is called the new operator. And then the other one, the complement per se, is the delete operator. Okay? So operator new. Let's talk about that one first. To create a variable, a dynamic variable, you're going to use the new operator in the following syntax. So this is the syntax that you use. You write the word new, which is your keyword to create. Let me zoom in. And then you're going to put the data type that you want to create. So it's very important to specify the correct data type because what the data type is telling the system is what you want to store in this newly created variable. So if you want to store an integer, that takes four bytes like we said last time. But, well, depending on your OS, but most modern OS is four bytes. If you're trying to store a double, that is going to take eight bytes. And so because you're asking for a new space, the computer needs to know how much space you want so that you can use it, right? It's like, okay, can you give me a room with one bed and then you throw 100 people in there? The hotel's gonna be like, yo, what the heck? Like, you know, get more rooms or something, right? So you, uh, you, have, to, you have to ask for the right amount. Otherwise, uh, bad things can happen, okay? So this, if you are using proper terminology, is called allocate a single dynamic variable, okay? And while we're at it, if you would like to allocate more than one variable, so like an array, then you would use the following syntax. So you would say new, you put your data type, and I'll show you examples of this, of course, tons of them for the rest of the semester, actually. And then you put some sort of initialization expression in here, and your semicolons. What this means is if I would like to create an integer array of size 10, you would say something like new int and then put a 10 in here. Now, the reason why I'm saying this init expression abbreviation in here and not just saying like a number, like a constant, is because that's the beauty of these dynamic memory allocations. Whereas technically speaking in C++, you have to decide at compile time how big your array should be. You have to feed in a constant value there, hard code it. With, an, with a dynamic array, you don't need to. You can make that be a variable that is defined when, when it's actually needed, what the size is. So for example, you could make a program that reads from the user like a number and it allocates that much memory based on the number that you feed it in. And uh, yeah, it, it, that's what we want. We want to be able to, to, to have all the freedom to decide how much memory we need it we need and when we need it. Okay, so let's go ahead and do some examples. Let's start with it with a single variable. Okay, so examples. Oops, examples. Let's say that we want to create a integer. Okay, if you just write the following code, you have created an integer, like somewhere in your main memory some address, remember these are hex, you have created an integer. And there's garbage in it, but it exists. But here's the issue. This is like saying to the hotel, give me a room, please. And the hotel's like, okay, you have been assigned a room. Have a nice day. And you're like, um, okay, what room number is it? It's like, I don't know, but it's a room. 
Have fun finding it. Wait, even if I do find it, how will I know it's mine? I don't know. There's no labels, nothing. But somewhere in the hotel, a room has been assigned to you. Have a nice day. And you're like, okay. <laughs> you can't do anything. <laughs> what are you going to do? Like, you could go and open 10 rooms and they all look brand new and clean. And one of them could be yours or maybe none of them are yours. Like, you don't know which one it is. So it's not enough to just allocate a variable. You need to store its address somewhere. You need to store what room it is. So what kind of variable have we been talking about for the past day can store an address of a variable? A pointer. So pointer is going to come to the rescue. So you can do this in two lines, but first I'm going to show you how to do it in one line. Oh, sorry, sorry. First, I'm going to show you how to do it. In, you can do it in one line, but first, I'm going to show you a two-line version of it. And uh, the first line is going to be to make a pointer. So let's just make a pointer called P. And now, when we call our new line, we want to assign that to the pointer. So when you say new int, the new operator is going to return. So think like a function. It's going to return to you an address. And if you store that somewhere, good for you. If you don't, it just gets thrown away and now we're stuck with the unknown lobby, unknown room number. So you want to store it somewhere. And that somewhere is a pointer that you made. So doing this line of code, two lines of code, you are creating a new integer and you're storing the address in P. So somewhere in main memory, and this one's not dynamic, this one's like a good old old school variable, you have your P. Somewhere in memory. So, and, and this right now has like some unknown address in it. So this one is the, what I would consider using the word static. This is a static variable as in like, not static like an object or the program is static, static in the sense of memory. It's not dynamic, it's static. So completely different uses of the word static here than that I've been using in the past. It's a static, it leaps in what is known as the stack of the program, call stack. So there's two terms in memory, there's heap and there's stack. The heap is where all the dynamic variables live, heap spelled this way. And the stack is where all the static variables live. By the way, both of them live in the same stick of RAM. It just turns out that, that they start them from different sides. So if you think of this as your really thick stick of RAM, the heap variables you start doing all the way here, like you build them up in that direction. The stack variables you start building from this direction. The advantage of doing a system like this is that if you have a bunch of heap variables and a little bit of stack, you can do that. You can also do the opposite. You have a bunch of stack and little heap. You can do that. You could also be perfectly balanced as all things should be and make it balanced, right? So. You could you have the advantage of doing this sort of indexing for heap and stack memory allows you to have a very flexible memory. Whereas if this is like a like an eight gig RAM stick, you know, here it's about four gigs each. Here it's about like six and two maybe, and here it's two and six. So you can have up to six gigs of heap memory in these scenarios. Whereas if you if you said okay, I'm going to make like half and half exactly, then then like. This program would work, but then these programs wouldn't work, even though you have the memory capable of that, which people would be like, what the heck? I have 32 gigs of RAM, and like my program is not running, even though it needs 20. Like, why? Well, it's because maybe you're doing, your system has a weird thing where it's doing like 16 and 16, right? So nobody does that. They all use this sort of shared method. Don't worry. Again, this stuff is stuff you're going to learn when you get to uh, 219. But it's good to introduce right now, just so you're aware that that's how that happens, okay? So the addressing will be different. In your case, when you, when you look at the address of a heap variable, the numbers will be very, very different than the ones from the stack, okay? Uh, so if we, used, if we did not use the pointer, we are pretty much roomless. Yes, you, you will not have access to your room if you don't store the room number somewhere. So when you use a new operator, you wanna store that immediately into your pointer address, okay? Like essentially, yes, like what you said, like you lost the keys to the room. So this is, you can think of the P as literally like a person with a baseball bat. And then the new is like the, you know, as soon as you call new, it just throws the address and you catch it. You're like, bam, caught it. Fine, now I know where it's at. If you don't catch it immediately, it's gone. All right, so cool. The way you combine these two lines into one, by the way, 
is you can just do the following. Okay, so now that line of code is going to both create a pointer variable and also dynamically allocate memory to it. Okay, so, uh, you know, both of them do the same thing. Although I would encourage you if you're going to be using this, this two line method to uh, initialize that to null PTR. Although you might be like, the next line I'm, I'm assigning it, so do I really need to do this? And I would answer to you, well, if that's the case, then why don't you just do the single line version, right? Just get into the habit of always setting things to zero. If there's if there's one thing you don't want, like I said, is to have a pointer variable containing an invalid address because it's impossible to know that it's invalid. There's no easy code or library that can tell you that. Like, at least in T++. Other languages with garbage collection and whatnot, you're not dealing with any of this stuff. But with T++, you don't have an easy way of knowing if an address is actually something that is good for you, like, an, like a valid address or it's garbage address. You have no way of knowing. So you don't want to end up in a situation where you have an address that is invalid because who knows what's going to be there. Like you will end up somewhere you do not want to be. Okay. So yep, that is your dynamic allocation. Now let's talk about the other side. Everything that has a beginning has an end. So let's talk about its end. So we have the delete operator or keyword, it's also a reserved keyword technically, okay? So with the delete, you use that to destroy or the allocate dynamic memory. <laughs> Do not try to use delete on a static variable. If you do, you're gonna get this like nasty, nasty, nasty error with like, <laughs> A bunch of lines of error message that are like a dump or something which will be completely useless to you and you're gonna be like freaked out so uh, I mean try it once try it at home per se but so you can see what see it's good to see these errors because then you like you recognize them and be like okay when I see this error again I know what it is versus like this is the first time I see this and the assignment is doing 10 minutes oh my god you don't want to be in that situation so it's actually good to fail in this kind of coding stuff to see these errors ahead of time so you can learn them and not not be afraid of them but uh so yeah this is definitely one of those like try at home okay uh, just don't try it on like on like a system where you have something important you know because this will you know like like hey let me try this on my on the code for my pacemaker like no no no, no. okay yes fail in control environments that's like the whole purpose you're in school right is to fail and control environments. Okay, so the way you use the delete keyword and the operator is pretty uh, pretty straightforward also. You call delete and then you put the identifier of what you're trying to delete. So for example, if you were trying to delete the pointer P, you just say delete P, like that. And that's just going to deallocate a single dynamic variable. Okay, uh, if you want to deallocate an array, I don't quite have the space for that unless I move my stack. Let me just move the stack. Just throw it down here. For an array of these, uh, this syntax looks weird. You'll probably forget it. That's fine, just write it down somewhere. Use it enough and then you'll remember it. Delete. Emphasize there's a space here between delete and that, and then the name of the variable. So, uh, do we ever make an array here? We didn't make an array with this one, so let's make an array and then delete it. So, uh, let's say we do an array of characters. So, we're gonna call this uh, character pointer uh, word, and then we're going to assign that a new car of size five again this doesn't have to be a constant this could be a variable that you modify at runtime in fact you want it to be that because that's why you're doing this but you can also make it a constant so this is allocating an array notice that the only sort of strange thing is that you're used to when you're creating an array saying something like int a gets five right well here 
you still got your indexing like this, but unlike the int a gets five, here you're putting the data type, right? So new car five. So that's creating an array of characters. Or sorry, it's, yeah, uh, it's creating a character array. No, array of characters is the right way to say that. An array, yeah, it's creating an array of characters of size five. To deallocate such array, you need to call delete, put the square bracket thing, and then put your identifier of what the array is and your semicolon, I guess. That's important too. So in our case, if we wanted to delete the word character array, you say delete, square brackets, word, like that. And that is going to the allocate array, which we call dynamic array, actually. Okay, that's that. That's a little weird. Don't don't get you know. It's kind of it feels like it's backwards, but it's just the way it is. Okay, the way that that's set up. Uh, you'll get used to it. But uh, here's kind of the catch with this: one-dimensional arrays, piece of cake to do this stuff. As you can see, when things with pointers, the higher you go with like in depth with like class inside of class, things get nasty. The arrow operator saves us there. We don't have such a sal salvation for when we're doing multi-dimensional dynamic arrays. There isn't a sort of delete that you can do like this for like a 2D array. You can't really do that. So uh, we'll, we'll play around with that in the next class or maybe, maybe at the end of this class if we have time. We'll play around how to deallocate multi-dimensional arrays but uh it is gonna it is gonna become a little nasty okay uh so we have a question if you were making your own program what would you want to use pointers so at this point don't think about pointers think about dynamic memory you want to use pointers when you're dealing with dynamic memory so the real the real question that you should be asking is when do you want to use dynamic memory and like i said you want to use dynamic memory when you're trying to optimize your program to only allocate memory that you need when you need it. So if I'm going to load in some big piece of data, I create an array, I throw all the data in there, or I create a dynamic object, throw all the data in there, work with it, finish it, and then I don't need it anymore, deallocate it. Next piece of data comes in, fill it up, same, get out. Of course, I could just make one static array and then just keep overriding the data there, that could work too. It's 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 it really depends. I mean, all the programs that you've done so far in like your C plus plus career per se and two hundred two and one hundred five are tiny little programs, right? They're nothing really big. And so, you know, it's not a it's not representational of what you're going to see in the real world when you're seeing lots of data. So there are there you know. You are going to need a lot of memory to do a lot of real things. And they're not things you want to just hog the memory forever. Because you might have a program that is running nonstop for, for days. And so you want to only use the memory that you need to use. So I would say that you, anytime you don't need a variable the entire time a program is running, you should probably make it dynamic so that you can only create it when you need it and then delete it, deallocate it when you don't need it anymore. I think that's a good rule of thumb. That's one, one usage of that. Now, as for pointers as a whole, there's another big usage of that. When we get to teach, talking about a linked list data structure, that which is like a month or two from now, it's almost at the end of the, the semester, that is going to be very, very useful way of storing data that requires us to use pointers and dynamic memory allocation again. So that will be a really good, that'll be like, I, I would say of the class, that will be the first example where like, it's actually like, okay, you'll be like, okay, this is actually useful in life. And like, I can understand why pointers actually make it useful. With, that, with, a, with a linked list, you're able to insert data anywhere in the list without having, like right now with an array, if you want to insert a number in the middle, you got to like move everything back one so that you can put it in or make a brand new array. It's not easy. Linked list, you can do it immediately. So that will be, I suppose, the first real practical usage of a pointer and dynamic memory allocation. But you'll get to see some cool stuff with the assignments and whatnot. Uh, so when you made that huge program that was similar to a first assignment, do you use dynamic memory allocation? 
Uh, that was similar to our first assignment. So are you talking about Tamagotchi or are you talking about like the Unigram assignment? I'm not sure which one you're talking about. But uh, you can definitely do the Unigram assignment. Yeah, so the Unigram assignment, you do want you want to use dynamic memory allocation for that. In the real world scenario, you would. In fact, in fact, here's a, here's a surprise. Vectors that you, you probably use to get around issues with that program, vectors are dynamic memory allocation. You, they just kind of hide it behind the scenes. So when you have a vector and you call your, your, your pushback function, it's inserting things into your vector and the vector is like, you know, they pick a size initially. There's a way you can change that default value, but like let's say the default size was 10. When it starts getting filled up, if it needs to resize, it'll resize. All that resizing and whatnot, it's all dynamic memory allocation behind the scenes. You don't get to see the pointers. You don't get to see the new operator. You don't get to see the delete operator. None of that you get to see, but it's happening there. Well, delete, yeah, delete might happen like a copy constructor or something. So yeah, but uh, but yeah, it is definitely there. You just don't see it. So yes, definitely like assignment one, you kind of had to use a vector or if you knew the dynamic memory allocation, then yes, that would work too. Back when I did my own assignments for the class, and I had that first iteration of the Unigram assignment, I actually made them as an assignment to change it, to use dynamic memory allocation so they could see how it could just work much better that way. But, uh, you know, now you're doing other assignments, I guess. Which, by the way, I, uh, four and five are posted now. So uh, have fun with that. I, I think five is actually pretty cool. So four is... Is it four? Yeah, yeah. It's one of the two is really cool. The other one's just like an assignment. But the other one's like, oh, wow, this is actually fun. So have fun with that. Uh, okay. There's there's a couple of other terms that I want to talk to you and situations that I want to talk to you about before I jump into coding. So even if you don't get to too much coding, uh, I need you know to under, you understand these things. Uh, we have a question, though. So for example, or here, actually let's go in order. So I've heard that using the stack is faster than the heap. So should we prefer using memory allocation on the stack for performance? The stack is the one that's not dynamic. The heap is the dynamic one. The reason why the stack is faster per se is because you know at compile time how much memory you make and it's already made for you and you know exactly where it's at so you can access it faster dynamic stuff is the one where like you're getting a room at some point and it's all over the place potentially so the heap can be a little bit slower because of that but it's insignificant so like it shouldn't matter to you really like there are other things you can worry about more for optimization than whether something goes on stack on heap in my opinion so that's kind of like the short answer for that uh, then we have a question. So, for example, in video games, when you're moving and things in the distance start disappearing, is that similar to dynamic memory location? Uh, yes, a little bit, yes. Because when you're doing rendering in a game and you are trying to optimize it, you don't want to have everything loaded in main memory because you might saturate your main memory. So, you may actually unload objects that are outside of a certain range, such as the visible range, to save memory and be able to not run out of memory. So games like Grand Theft Auto that are like massive will do that all the time. But in, within Unity, there are ways you can do that. You can actually optimize, uh, like render distance to, to, to the unload objects. And yes, technically when you unload them, that could actually be the allocation. Although if you know Unity, when you instantiate an object in Unity, uh, like you're spawning it, which I think is called the, it's called instance or, huh? Oh, I wrote it down the other day. Make sure. I want to make sure I'm not telling you the wrong name. I think it's called instantiating, but there's destroy. In Unity, the destroy function is a deallocate function. Instantiate, yeah. So you instantiate a game object reference. Yeah. So and you give it a a, a vector and a, and a so it's a location and a rotation. So when you instantiate an object in Unity, which is when you spot when you create it the first time, that's your allocation. And when you destroy it is when you deallocate it. Although that may that instantiation does take some processing power and time. So if you ever played a game and you have things that like pop up kind of slow, if you're that could be because you're instantiating something which will like it'll uh it might not spawn quick enough 
So it might be useful to instantiate something, but then hide it and have it ready to go. So you have a sort of a pipeline of what you see, what you don't see, but it's already there, and then what you haven't even loaded in. But there's also, it's not just all about allocation too. There's just loading stuff too from like hard drive to, to RAM too. So some of that is just like, you're not allocating a variable, you're just loading it from hard drive. So it's, it's games can get really complicated. So, you know, I don't want to overgeneralize, but yeah, you kind of had the right idea with that, with the memory loading stuff. Uh, so, yep, anyways, let's not get too off topic. Uh, you know, someday I hope they let me, I would like to teach a Unity class at UNLV. Uh, they do teach one, but it's not taught that often. So, yeah, be fun, like C Sharp. So, okay. So, um, let me give you two of the bad things that can happen with pointers uh, and memory, okay? And uh, let's build up to them by showing you this example, okay? So, the first one is going to be that suppose that we have a pointer. I'll just do P, less writing. And we are going to assign our pointer to actually store a integer. Okay? And uh, let's here kind of keep track of what we're doing. So we have two variables. Uh, let's just say we have our stack and our heap. And so in the stack, we have our P, which is some address. Doesn't really matter, but we'll put that address in there. And then... Um, We'll just store something in here, which is the address of the dynamically allocated variable, which is this one here. So this is our new int. And this is some other address. So let's just say this is an address that, I don't know. Um, actually, no, because that would be right before the other one, technically. So let's just, no, let's just do 100, whatever. Uh, and this has some garbage in it. But this here has address 100, okay? so. That's what we have done with the first line of code right there. All right. So P is pointing here, which means we can work with that. Okay, very cool. You know, we can we can store some data in there. So let's say we store 42 in there. We dereference that, which remember the asterisk means you dereference, which means you go to that address and then store the 45 in the address that the pointer is storing. So what is the pointer storing? Address 100, again in hex. So go to address 100 and store 45 there. So basically we store 45 here. Okay, cool, not bad. If we want to deallocate it, we could delete whatever, but we're so excited that we just learned pointers that we're like, awesome. Let's make another pointer. I'm mean, sorry, let's make another uh, dynamic variable. So you say P is going to, oh wait, actually, you don't need the asterisk there. You say p gets new. Oh, did I did I ever write the asterisk? No, I didn't. I thought I wrote the asterisk here, but yeah. See, this is important. I guess I should kind of point this out. Notice that when I do this line of code here, I don't put an asterisk there because what I'm doing is I'm changing the contents of p, not what p is pointing to. So that's why there's no asterisk when I say p equals new int like that. This looks a little misleading on the top because you have the asterisk, but remember, p itself is just holding an address. That's what pointers hold addresses. So this is just changing that address. When I put an asterisk like this, I'm saying go to the address that I'm holding and then change what's there. So that's why this is 45. So in this line we need it, I'm gonna say p gets new int. Okay? This is allocating a brand new address. So now somewhere else in, in the heap, actually I'm gonna put it down here so I don't collide with the other stuff. So let's say this is address 400. We're making a new integer, another new integer. And right now it has, again, garbage in it, okay? And you're like, oh wow, this is so cool, I made another address. Okay, let's store some numbers in there. So you're like P equals uh, 21. Okay, so we put in there 21. And then you're like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm so hyped. Let me go ahead and clean up after myself. I'm going to deallocate some stuff. So then you say delete P. What that's going to do is it's going to deallocate stuff. So delete P is going to deallocate the address that P is pointing to. Uh, oh, by the way, this got updated to address 400 because now we are no longer pointing to the top one. 
we are now pointing to the second one that we did, right? So like if I say see how, well, let's say C, if I say see P and I say see how asterisk P, this is going to print out the address of P, so zero so address 400, and of course the contents of what P is pointing to, which is 21, right? So it's gonna print these two out. Shrink it and kind of leave it there. Okay. All good so far here to make sure we don't get lost. So when we say delete P, we're saying delete address 400. So the allocate address 400. So that address. Where is that address? Right here. So all that is going to do is it's going to say, okay, you know, along with this, you can think of a, like a little checkbox here that says that these are ours. So all it's doing is kind of erasing that checkbox and saying, okay, this memory is no longer yours. You have returned the keys, it is somebody else's, okay? But yes, what you just said is what I was going to say. What happens to the address 100? Like, what's up with that? To the lobby or to the operating system, the hotel, they still have you booked as that belonging to you. But you, you don't know that. Or maybe you do. You know that you have a room. But guess what? You lost your keys. Because you, when you created the second dynamic variable, when you created this, this new int here, you overrode the address that you originally had. So you overrode address 100 with 400. So that information is lost. And so now, even if you wanted to be a good citizen and say, uh, hi, I would like to return this room because I no longer need it. I used it for a meeting. The lobby knows that you have it, but like it's a really weird system where like for let's just say like for lobby purpose, for security purposes, they can't look up which rooms you own. So you can't ask the lobby what rooms you own. Unless you check out everything, it knows to cancel everything out. But for security reasons, they can't see it. The computer kind of works the same way. The computer knows that you allocated it, but you can't really ask it to, uh, to tell you that you have it. Like, there's no way. Like, like when you when you go code and whatnot, unless you're running a specific tool meant for that, you have no way of knowing addresses of variables you've allocated if you lose the pointers, in which case you have here. So this is really bad because like, you have memory book to you but you can't use it because you don't have access to it. So forget the fact that you no longer can get that 45. That, you know, it's a loss. But like the bigger loss here is that you are hoarding memory that, does, that, that, that is linked to you, but you can't even use it. So you can't use it and nobody else can use it because it's booked to you. So it's like a double problem. This has a name for, uh, for in computers. And uh, I'm sure you've heard it before. Thinking about games, you heard it pretty often. And it is known as a memory leak. You have created a memory leak. So if you heard that term, which I'm pretty sure most of you like, I would be surprised if you've never heard that term. Uh, a memory leak is essentially this. You dynamically allocated memory, and for one reason or the other, you lost access to it because you lost a pointer to it. Now, this is very easy to avoid in a simple example because you could just make another pointer and then use that pointer instead. But appreciate the fact that when code becomes really convoluted and complicated and you're using loops and all these things, it's not as easy to, to like track these things. So it's, it, it, it can happen that, that you, like, you, you, don't, you don't have the intentions to do this, but somewhere in your code there's a little bug that does not deallocate some memory and you lose access to it. And then you end up with these inadvertent memory leaks. And like code like a game that's just running constantly, you might have a couple of these, you know, every hour. So you might not notice this when, you, when you're running your programs for like five minutes. But when you run your programs for five days, these start to build up. Because let's say that every hour you allocate one variable that you lose. Yeah, four bytes is nothing. 
4 bytes, 8 bytes, whatever. We have gigabytes. We have ter well, not terabytes. We have gigabytes of RAM, most of us. One byte is not, 4 bytes is not going to do anything. Sure, but 4 bytes every day over the course of a long time is going to build up to the point where you're going to run out of memory and you're going to crash. So, yep, yeah, that happens very often to pretty much, I would say, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big statement to say, but I'm going to stick to it, that I would say that the majority of the large programs you deal with, whether it be a game or just software or anything, are going to have as, at least some form of a small degree, at least, of memory leaks in it. Because it's, it's practically impossible to, to, to check a code so thoroughly that you can guarantee that it will not have any problems in terms of memory leaks. And they actually, this gets pretty... Uh, pretty theoretical in computer science to actually check that stuff. You, When you take like Automata and those kind of classes, they're going to talk about all these theoreticals and like Turing machine and whatnot, and like how uh, satisfiability and things like that. So yeah, you'll get to see these things in the future and uh, you know, kind of the idea that it's practically impossible. In fact, it is, it is, practic it is, it is practically impossible to determine, to write a program that can immediately determine whether a subset of code is going to terminate or not. Just to terminate. Like, will my code be in an infinite loop forever or will it terminate? There's no way that you can write a program that can do that uh, for all instances of code. You can write it for some of them. Like, you know, have a program that checks whether your for loops go from zero to a value that is not infinity. But for all code that could somebody generate with a language, if you try to write one program that can check all codes possible that could exist for a language, you can't do that. It's, a, it's a theoretically impossible. So it's really high level stuff. Okay. So ultimately what I'm trying to get to is that memory leaks are a fact of life, but you want to avoid them as much as possible. So uh, don't do them. And there's a program that I'm going to show you next time that's called Valgrind. Then you can use with the kind of programs that we have in school, which are tiny programs, to test me for memory leaks, okay? Yeah, th that's right, it's called the halting problem. Uh, so you can definitely Google that. They'll talk about that in in, uh, in Automata and also probably in algorithms. Uh, I have a video on that a little bit for my 302 class, but I don't, I, I don't usually talk about it in 302, uh, other than briefly mentioning it, kind of like I did that. But uh, I did one one semester to talk about it, so you'll learn about it. It's cool stuff too. But um, it's also there's also another one called the grading problem, which you can check out. It's kind of kind of the same thing. Okay, so that's what memory leaks are, and um, the terminology that I have for that is that address 100 is is inaccessible. So. Okay, I cannot. That, <laughs> I went a little bit crazy with the with the letter duplication there. It's inaccessible. There we go. Okay, it cannot be reallocated and it cannot be deallocated at that point. Okay, and uh, again, memory leak is a new space that cannot be reallocated or deallocated. Okay, so how do we solve the memory leak problem? A couple of ways that we can do that. One of them is if we are re you know if if we intend to never use this variable again. Then we can say delete p, and this fixes memory leak. Another thing that we can do is that we can use a completely different pointer for this and keep the other one so that we can deallocate it whenever we do need to deallocate it. But ultimately, memory leaks are a combination of not overriding addresses you still need and those that you don't need to make sure that you deallocate them before you override them and lose them. Okay? Solution sounds simple in practice, in, in like theory, but I guess that in practice it's not easy. You know, it's very not easy to remember these things. Uh, you'll appreciate it with time. Okay, so let's talk about another issue with this code. So for, I'll just do a brand new code for that though. Let's say that I make another program. Let's do a different thing than integer. Let's do like a, let's do a flow. We always use integer. Or something like that. There's other things in the world too. So we got a float. 
Oh, but actually, <laughs> if we do that, we're so used to this, I could keep writing this. But now this actually has to be float, not int. So that's good that we're doing something else. Okay, so here we got a float pointer. And uh, we're assigning a float to it. Surprise, surprise. Okay, so let's throw something in the float. Well, we could say 42F, but here, let's just do 40.5F like that. Okay. Uh, fun fact that you might not know, if, depending on your 135 instructor, when you assign a value to a float like this, when you well, just in general, whenever you write a variable in C++ by just putting in like a 40, 40 when you assign a, a variable in C++ with a decimal value like this, if you don't put anything in front of it like this, it is assumed and stored to be a double. So 42.5 is actually a double. This can cause some issues if you're storing it in a float because a double in a float, a double has more precision. So like I've seen cases where like, if I write the following code, Right here, actually, I think if it is not equal. I've seen cases where so if you write a code like this with some numbers, I don't think it'll be 2.3, but some numbers, this will actually see out question marks or exclamation marks. The flow and the double will not be the same. And the reason why is because, again, this 2.3 is being cast, even though you don't see it here, this is actually a double that's being cast or coerced, that's the right term, is being coerced to a float. And uh, they're not equal if you try to compare them because of that. This will be this will get coerced maybe like a, a 2.33 or some some weird situations like that. And uh, yeah, bad things will happen. Like really, really bad things will happen. <laughs> that's that's the stuff you don't want to have in your code. Those are the worst kind of bugs. Uh, I don't remember what numbers they are, but uh, if you Google them, like there's some really simple numbers that can cost it. Like 3.33 might cost it. I really don't remember. But to avoid this kind of weird nastiness, uh, be aware of that. Be aware that that like when you just assign a decimal point value like this, it's actually a double. So if you want to guarantee that it's a float to avoid weird scenarios, then you can do this. And then if you're trying to compare, like if you're trying to do something like uh, if PTR is equal to 42.5, put an F in there as well. And then your this comparison will always be guaranteed to be okay. That one will always be okay as well. But if you do that, then you're running into problems if 42 and double is not equal to 42.5 in flow, okay? So this is good for clarifying for everybody that this is a flow. And this is good if you wanna compare this to a flow or just use doubles the whole time and never have to worry about this, which is perfectly fine in my opinion. Though then again, a, a double that does take twice the space of a float, so yeah, there is a cost associated with that decision, but whatever, I still use a double anyway. In fact, languages like Python, when you use a float, that's just a double. They have, there's no real floats in Python, so yeah, people just don't wanna avoid this kind of nastiness. Anyways, going back to this, uh, we created a float, we sort of float in it, we use whatever we need to do with it, do the math. You know, there's some magical code happening here. Now comes time to delete it. So we don't want memory leaks. So we're like, okay, let's be extra safe and say delete PTR. Here's a simple tip to avoid memory leaks in simple programs. The moment you do allocation like this, write the code to delete it and just leave some space so that it's just somewhere in your code base. So that, that's, you know, later, you're obviously gonna write more code in between because you need to do stuff with the variable, but at least you wrote the delete. So it's almost like a reminder like to delete it. That way you don't forget. It's a nice little tip. What will work for simple examples, not really for complex stuff, but at least that's a good starting point when you're trying to remember this. But okay, you got your delete in here. You use it, you're happy. You move on. Your code is good, but technically, your code is the equivalent of like saying, I have diffused a bomb, but I still leave it out there. Like, 
sure you defuse the bomb, but if you don't like go take it somewhere safe, what stops somebody from accidentally touching it and making it explode again? Like accidentally reconnecting the wires you cut or something, right? Uh, would you get an error if you type delete PTR? Yes, you would because the delete operator is expecting a address and PTR is holding that address. Whereas this is holding whatever the address is pointing to, which is actually the number 42.5. So you would be trying to essentially delete whatever 42.5 in binary gets translated to an address system in hex, which would not be 42.5, it would be just some weird number uh, with zeros and ones, which would get, I don't know, address 1 billion 50, and that would crash because that's not doesn't belong to you. Uh, so yeah, don't, uh, don't put asterisk there. Okay, so anyways, what I'm saying with this is that it's like the bomb example. So you, you have defused the bomb, you cut the wires, but then you're so happy, you just leave the bomb on the table, go home, and then somebody else comes in and says, hey, what is that? What happens if I touch these cables? And then bam, the bomb explodes, right? So this is the same idea here. When you deallocate a pointer by calling delete, the name is a little bit misleading because it says delete, but you're not deleting anything. All you're doing is telling the computer like, hey, I'm done with this. Feel free to use it now. So if I if I redraw our uh, our memory here, here's my float. It's a float, so it's four bytes. You know, it's address 100, and then here's my pointer to that. So actually, technically, this is pointer, and this is the new float. This is address 500, and so this is address 100 in it. And this has the number 42.5. Okay, so when I said the al delete, all I'm doing again is sort of checking this off as like, okay, here's my room keys back. Feel free to give this to any other guest now. I'm done with it. But here's the issue. This is the this, this is an example that I give for this to. Uh, in the past, before I thought about the hotel example, I thought about like an apartment example, okay? This is like, imagine you had an apartment and you know what room it is and you have keys for it and you made a bunch of duplicates and you return the keys but you still have a duplicate key because you still know the room, okay? And then you are so tired when you come back from work that you go to your old apartment and you go there and you open it because you still have old keys and you go in there and then somebody else is living there and they freak out and they call the cops and you're in jail because they thought you were breaking in, which you technically were, trespassing. So you don't want that. You don't want to accidentally access things that no longer belong to you. When you give something away, when you return it to the OS, it's no longer yours. So any reference to it should be deleted. You don't want to accidentally call your ex, right? You don't want to call your ex. So you want to delete the phone number afterward so that you don't call your ex, right, by accident. The same thing here. You don't want to access things that are no longer yours. So what you want to do is after you call delete, erase the pointer by setting something there, like no PTR or null or whatever. By doing this, you have severed the link. So now this is like erasing from your mind your old address where you used to live so you don't accidentally stumble there and break in or erasing from your phone any access so you don't accidentally call them right this is good this is actually solving a problem which is if you if you don't have this line of code and you actually go ahead and say ptr in fact you could even just say you could either do see out ptr or worse yet, you could modify PTR. This may or may not work. 99% of the time it actually will work, which is really, really dangerous because you are modifying stuff that no longer belongs to you. These variables have been deallocated. You can still access them. So this would still print out the 42 and you can even modify them and, and store more data in them, but they don't belong to you anymore. And so it's a really, really bad practice because in theory, although very unlikely to happen, in theory, the OS could reassign it to somebody else. In theory, you're, the 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 the, uh, the hotel might give the room to another guest, or you, if you're renting, they might give it to somebody else, and that's when you really run into trouble because, like, you're modifying somebody else's 
code at that point, somebody else's program at that point, right? So while the OS has a lot of safeguards and typically doesn't do this for small code, if you're allocating these massive arrays and the OS is like, okay, I actually really need this now that you can bring it back, that's when you run into those issues, okay? So you won't run into them when you are doing tiny programs with one or two variables that are dynamic, but when you're doing these massive dynamic allocations, like for games and things like that, that actually like it's memory that even you might want to reuse somewhere else and you might get reassigned the same memory, that's even worse because then you, that's really, really bad. So like, okay, you use this variable, you return it, you allocate a completely different variable and you actually get this variable back over there, but you still have an access here. So now you have this like massive circle of chaos. You don't want that. So to avoid this issue, like the memory leak issue, it's relatively simple in, in, in practice, uh, but in, in theory, but in practice, it can get pretty complicated. Uh, but again, you just need to set it to null. You just severe the link, and once you severe the link, even if you try to, you can't access it anymore because you don't know it anymore. And to do that, just set it to null. That's, again, our sort of basic term for clearing it out. And this has a name, and that name is called a dangling pointer. So do I have a little definition somewhere in here for that? Mm, unfortunately, I do not have one for that, but um, it just, it basically means accessing a reference that is no longer yours or accessing a reference that you've deallocated. Okay. So you don't want that. Memory leaks and dangling pointers are the two major issues that you're going to run into with, when dealing with dynamic memory allocation and pointers. And uh, of them, memory leaks are bad in terms of the OS and performance, but they won't break a program. They'll break the computer if you use enough, if you have enough memory leaks. Dangling pointers will cause you more problems because you're 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 playing with fire, essentially, by modifying memory that no longer belongs to you. Right, so you don't want that. So yeah, that's it. That's that's pretty much all of the pointer stuff that you need to know. So from now on, it's just a matter of of practice. And by the way, for the dangling pointer, a good rule of thumb is that whenever you have delete, you should have a line beneath it that sets whatever you did the delete on to null. So like I do here. So just have two lines here that always like yin and yang kind of thing. Like you always be together. So that way you avoid uh, forgetting that, okay? So whenever you call delete, have a line beneath that sets to null. When we talk more about the destructor for a class, that's a good place to do these kind of things. Uh, also, when memory allocation, you know, that one's a little bit harder to keep track of. But definitely for this one, it's just a good practice to learn. Always set pointers to null after you delete them. And remember, delete is not the same as the allocate. It's misleading. All you're doing when you say delete PTR is you're releasing that lock on that variable to others, but the contents are still there. It's just up to you not to access them anymore because they're no longer belonging to you, but nothing has been deleted. Uh, I can, yeah, I can, I can hang out for a little bit. For that but yep that is all that i have although i do have to talk with the somebody doing an advanced study advanced faculty advanced what is it called advanced placement or something in uh in cs and i told him i will talk with them at seven so we do have to finish by seven uh, advanced standing that's what it's called you all have to do that after you take 302 i think so you get assigned a faculty to be your mentor and then uh, and then you just make them fill a form and they talk to you and help you out but yeah okay so that was a lot of material actually for today but uh, like I said this should be enough to get you going we are going to do examples of this next class so uh, that way you you know you get if you get stuck as you code this but it'll be good that you code it because you get to see it. Really what the, the examples I'm gonna focus on doing next time is going to be uh, like multi-dimensional array allocation. Because like, you know, I could show you the same code I did right now. Like here's a memory, here's a memory leak. 
But I do want to show you how to use Balgrind. So I'll use I'll show you Balgrind next time. Okay. Um, all right. So that's it for the class. Uh, I guess I'll answer now the question about the header files. So let's see. I've seen to use Pragma once, but I'm not really sure why it doesn't header files. Pragma is, I believe, strictly connected to pre preprocessor directives that they're called. So if you look into something like the compiler's documentation, which is here, it says the Pragma directive is the method specified by the C standard for providing additional information to the compiler. So it was introduced, well, that's, that's the underscore Pragma. Uh, why are you using Pragma? That's a better question, actually. I thought that you that that if you use pragmas, it wouldn't work with the auto grading system. So that makes me wonder. Like, tell me more about what you're doing with pragma. Or are you doing pragma once? If you look at the bottom of that of that documentation file, it says. Uh, if Pragma once is seen when scanning a header file, that file will never be read again, no matter what. So it's a less portable alternative to using the if not defined to guard the contents of a header file against multiple inclusions. Oh, okay. So I guess maybe that's far. In assignment rig without Pragma, I get a warning. Right. So with header files, when you are uh, when you're when you're compiling your code. What happens is you read a class, for example, or a header file that has a class declaration or something, and then you read a class definition, and then you're reading all these files, right? But you only want to read them once because, like, you don't want to create two classes called potato because then the compiler is going to be like, you already defined this class, like, what is happening? And then it'll stop. And so to avoid that, sometimes the way you write the code is going to force the file to be opened again and read. But if that happens, you're going to, again, hit this issue of it trying to redeclare something you already did. And so ways to get around that is to communicate to the compiler, like, hey, man, only look at this once. And if you've looked at this file once, never look at it again. And so the traditional way to do this is, re is we're using a define. So when you're using a define, what you do is you say something like define high. And what that does when you say define high is it, it's kind of like a little variable declaration that you're making, but in this case, it's a constant. And it just means that this thing exists. So I can check if this is six with an if statement. So I can say something like, if define high, then run this code. I believe you use else, run this code, and then you end the define with saying end if. I think, you know, my syntax might be rough because I'm using the while, but I think that's how you do it. So what this means is that if, if it sees a line somewhere in the code that says define, then what's going to happen is that you are going to go into this if statement. If it has never seen this line that says define high, then it's going to go into the else statement, okay? And there's also like an else if, elif, whatever, uh, for like complicated if statements, okay? And then because there's no curly brackets, this is sort of the curly bracket way of telling it. That's where the if statement ends. So you can use this like magic, dark magic, basically, to stop the compiler from reading a file. Uh, if you want to say whether something is not defined, you could, of course, just use the else clause. But you could also flip the logic by using if not defined. So you just put an n in there like that. Uh, and that's what the bottom says there. And then in this case, you know, you can say, and if you could also probably use the else clause, but you know, this piece of code is identical to whatever would run in the else clause. Okay, it's just it's just flipping it. You know, it's if, if it's in a scenario if you don't have an, an if part to it. So like, if I had an else clause here, you know, so let me just really quickly add an else clause. This piece of code would be identical 
to this piece of code. So you see, we're just flipping it. That's what that means, okay? So it's pretty trivial once you get it. Uh, you have to play around with it. But ultimately, the way that you that you wrap your header files to avoid the if defined issue is that, you know, at the top of the file, you, you could write something like define high. And then that means, that's like a flag that you've seen this file. So if you, but actually, you know, no, don't put it at the top, put it at the bottom, because if you put it at the bottom, so let's say this is your header file, you put it at the bottom, and then you put it at the top, this if not defined component. So let's just take, oops. Like that. And then we don't need the else clause for this. So if you, this is your header file, and the green stuff is actually your entire header file, like all the code there, okay? Nothing else would be outside of that. So you can write your code like that. And so the first time that you ever see this header file, this this high will not be defined. Oh, we'll, we'll forget about the word high here. So that's, that's what it's actually checking it against, okay? So if it says, if high is not defined, it'll run all this code. So it'll, it, you know, run the code that you want to run. And then at the end, it's going to define high. So the next time, if it ever, for some reason in your logic, gets this header file opens again and tries to compile it again, this time it will look at the high variable, but because you already declared it, it's going to be like, oh, this is already declared. And so it'll go straight to the end and it will not run that code again, which is good because you don't want to declare two potato classes, right? So that's the defines work. That's what I'm familiar with. The stuff you brought me down here today, which uh, I hadn't seen in a long time, Pragmas, I actually thought they were like a Visual Studio thing, kind of works the same way. If you write Pragma once, it's just somewhere in your file at the top. Actually, yeah, you probably want to put it at the top. It will do the same work as doing all this if not defined fanciness. You just put it at the top and you're done. Like just that and then just put your code. And in theory, that's all you need. In theory, in theory, I've never done it. That I, or at least I'm, maybe I have, but I don't remember. But in the long, in the like the long, in, in what I remember, I don't recall you playing with it. So I use this stuff if I ever have to use the preprocess the directive stuff. But I guess this does the same thing. Okay, so that's the really long answer to your question. Hopefully that. Uh... Now as to why you're getting that error, maybe you're using the top version, so try the bottom one or vice versa. Uh, check with Discord and see what other people have done. And then we have another question. Um, for the assignment, we're supposed to create a new C++ file for the functions of the header. For the, Quick question. For the assignment, were we supposed to create a new CPP file for the functions of header, or could we have made a function in the header file? I'm trying to understand what you're asking. Um, for the assignment, were we supposed to create a C++ file for the function of the header? Okay, yeah, I get that. Uh, okay, so both will work. The traditional purest way of doing it is that you write things like this in your header file. So, so the def so basically the uh, the class declaration, I believe that's the term. So you say something like void you put all your fields and that's it that goes in your header in the CPP file you would write something like your actual body of the functions that's the purest way so this is the dot h file and this is the dot CPP file you can however throw everything in your CPP file and I'm pretty sure that would compile or in the header file and that would be okay. Uh, so if the assignment makes you do it in a different way, you can. But in theory, you could do it like that uh, in one file and it'd be okay. Just make it, pro it probably wants it to be a CPP file. If you try to do everything in header, it might work, but uh, you, you know, ideally you want to split it. That's like the, that's the best way to do it, okay? But if you do all the splitting stuff, make sure that you, you do this pragma nastiness so that you don't, uh, you don't have the issues that uh, the bunky was having, okay? Uh, but like, 
you know, I would argue that if it's a really small function, defining it in the header is not necessarily a bad thing. But no, I don't, I, you know, just, just do what they tell you, basically. Do, do what they tell you, because otherwise, uh, I don't want you to lose points and whatnot, so. If, if it passes code grade, then, then it's good to go, I guess. All right, cool. Um, unless there's any other questions, I'm going to sign off so that I can do the meeting at seven with the student. I gotta open up Discord and see if they wrote something. Actually, I actually I I made it at seven ten, so I have I do I do have time. I remember. I think I did it seven ten just to be extra safe because I I do want time to actually upload the videos or start the upload at least. But all right, it seems like no more other questions. So uh, great. If you have any other questions, you can always post on Discord or send me an email, uh, and then either me or the TA and we can help you out. Uh, but Discord's nice because other people can chip in. Like they have, you know, they, they're doing the same assignment, so they know what the weird kind of issues you might run into with code grade. And I do remember seeing this whole Pragma stuff. Not the Pragma, but like the Define stuff. Somebody had an issue with that. They changed it and they fixed it. So check Discord. Uh, but yeah, okay, great. Well, then this is Wednesday, so I know most of you are gone now, which is fine. But uh, if you're still here, have a good weekend. And uh, I will see you next time. And then if you uh, let me know how you guys do with the assignment. If you need more time. Or if you're okay but not with well not with the one that's due today but like with the one that's due next week the one due today it's been like available for so long that hopefully you all finish it but yeah go finish that if not okay see you guys next time have a good weekend and take care <laughs>